preparing the paper for submission. You know, it's really important to read the instructions to authors. That's why they're called instructions to authors. And I'm really astounded how often people seem not to read the instructions to authors. We try to make ours as clear and um, helpful as possible. That means that they're not all that concise, so that's maybe not so good. But really, print them out, look at them repeatedly, about the format of the paper, about the length of text, the number of figures and tables, and the numbers of references, and the correct format for the references. It's really important that your title and abstract be um, as perfect as you can possibly make them. Don't write the abstract last, or like as an afterthought when you're finally submitting the paper, you're like, oh my god, I forgot to write an abstract. Um, because that's often the only thing that the editor will look at to decide whether your paper should be immediately rejected um, or sent out you know, for review or sent on forward in the process. It's very important to note the species and the model system that are being utilized in the title, um, not so much for the decisions about the review process, but for later on citing of your work and for people doing meta-analyses and data crunching. Um, don't take an abstract from a meeting submission that you, you know, sent to ASH and then you're writing the paper eight months later and you don't update the abstract. Because really when you're submitting an abstract to a meeting, it's a quite a different type of abstract. You tend to make it data heavy because it's the only thing the reviewers are going to see. And, you know, it may not be updated and you may have, you know, the abstract deadline was August 23rd and you were, you know, hiking and, you know, you wrote the abstract in 10 minutes on your iPhone. So really, you know, rewrite the abstract and make sure it's um, perfect. The style of the manuscript, you know, English is the universal language of science, like it or not, and you, so you have to use it accurately. You know, if you need help, get it. You know, if you have a co-author who is, you know, native English speaking or is very, very good, you know, one of their roles as a co-author should be to edit the paper carefully and help you with the English. Um, but if you don't have that option, there are many professional uh, medical editing services, and it's perfectly acceptable to use those services as long as you disclose that you've used it in the acknowledgments, and especially if you've gotten financial support from, say, a pharmaceutical company to get, get that kind of help, you have to disclose the funding for the editorial assistance. You know, avoid jargon and slang in your writing. Um, you know, it, it, you shouldn't be praising your own work. I've already told you that. It's kind of like if you praise it too much, then it makes the reader think that probably isn't that good if they have to keep saying how wonderful it is. Um, and I hate the word players, but I think that after five years of saying this, I haven't noticed any decrease in the use of the word players. Players are people in a play. Molecules aren't players, but anyway, I think I'm losing that one. <laughs> Preparing the paper. I've already said write concisely. That's my biggest problem. When I write, I have to cut out at least, what, at least half of what I've written to get it down to a reasonable level of conciseness. Um, but do make sure that all the information that's necessary for understanding the work appears in the primary text and not only in the supplements. So when they say that the word limit is 4,000 words, um, you know, don't take all the methods and put them in a supplement. I mean, some of the methods can go in a supplement, and some journals have a different policy, but I personally think that when you print out a PDF for a paper, you should be able to have some idea of what they did. And there's no, if there's no methods there, that's not okay. Um, but, you know, putting primer sequences, putting highly specialized buffers, whatever you want to put in the supplement that you don't need to read to understand what was done in the paper. But to understand what was done in the paper, I think it's important to know whether it was a mouse or, you know, a cell line or a human. And, you know, some papers literally don't have the information anywhere that you can figure out except going to a supplement. Don't attempt to fit the work into a brief report or other very short format if it's not appropriate. Um, you know, so it's not any easier for most journals to get a brief report accepted than a full-length article. And in fact, it's harder at Blood to get a brief report accepted. I think because people send in case reports and other things that, you know, are, are more likely not to be appropriate. But nonetheless, it's very frustrating when you're reading a paper and you have no idea what they did because they've somehow tried to get it into this really short format. Send it in as a regular article. If the editor thinks it can be shortened and they're interested in it, let them tell you, you know, please shorten this to a brief report. But don't do that de novo if it doesn't belong as a brief report. Now, some things really are brief reports. They're a really interesting but self-contained observation that you can explain in 1,200 words or one figure. But there's other things that can't be explained in that kind of format, so don't do it. Um, it's also ridiculous sometimes when people send in a brief report that has figure one panels A through ZZ. And, you know, each, each panel is, you know, I mean, at least as I age, I mean, I can't even begin to see what I'm supposed to be looking at in this panel. And then you blow it up on the screen and it's all these, these pixels. So, you know, so if it, it takes more than, you know, four or five panels, there shouldn't be just one figure. Split it up. 
Um, when you're referencing, it's very important to do the referencing accurately. You know, don't cite papers that you've only identified because somebody else referenced that paper in a prior reference list or review article without reading the paper yourself, at least reading the abstract and hopefully pulling the whole paper. Because it's like that game telephone when you whisper into somebody's ear and they whisper it along and then at the end it's totally different than the beginning. And you see references to things that, you know, they're talking about, oh, you know, this, you know, this drug has been shown to be effective and patients with, you know, thalassemia, and then you look at the paper and it's about mice, you know, so you need to, you know, or it's about, I don't know, sickle cell, not thalassemia. So it makes you look really stupid and really sloppy, which is not what editors want you to be or reviewers want you to be if you misreference. And it's also very bad to misreference a paper from a reviewer, you know, and it's very likely that your paper is going to go to a reviewer that knows the literature and contributed to the literature, and if you misreference or don't reference one of their seminal works, um, they're going to be very poorly disposed to, towards you. And throughout this process, you don't want to make the reviewer or the editor angry at you or annoyed with you. And so these are the kind of things that if you do them, it's just going to turn them off and it's very hard to turn them back on no matter how good your science is. So this is the kind of stuff you have to avoid. Um, and you know, it's not so good if you submit to science or cell and all of us know what the reference formats are for those journals. And then it comes to blood and you don't change the reference format. I mean, EndNote, and you know, it's one, it's one click. It's not that hard. You know, we used to actually have to retype them when I started in the lab, and that was a nightmare. Um, but now it's very easy. So, so do it. You know, change the reference format to be, you know, fit the journal that you've actually submitted to. So, you know, piracy and plagiarism is something you want to avoid. Um, and you know, piracy is basically stealing ideas or data. Plagiarism is actually reproducing without attribution or permission text figures or um, other data in your paper. And there is something, you know, self-plagiarism is a grayer area, meaning if you've written a prior review, can you actually use the same exact text again? You, you shouldn't. I mean, it's copyrighted with another journal. You know, if you went to court, there's, there's, it hasn't gone to court very often, but, you know, try to avoid it. Try to think about a new way to say something. Um, and if you're writing a paper and you've taken lots of notes from review articles, you know, when you take those notes, put quotes around them if they're verbatim because I see again and again people who kind of do inadvertent plagiarism because they don't remember if these notes they made were paraphrases or word for word and they cut it and paste it into their document and then it's, you know, it's the same. And there's, un fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of web crawling software that can pick this kind of stuff up and there's a lot of people who, I don't know, don't have enough to do but they've decided that their purpose in life is to be a whistleblower and to show that all science is is nefariously, um, you know, including plagiarism and data duplication. So, you know, it, it used to be quite hard to detect this stuff unless somebody actually read something that said, oh, that sounds familiar, I wrote that. Versus now, you know, people will scan every abstract from the ASH meeting and send us these lists of things that, you know, were, were published previously. Sometimes it's okay because it's their own work and it's a different meeting and, you know, it's an update of the same study, so of course most of it's the same. But in other cases it is nefarious and we have to investigate it, so don't do it.